Well, thank you, and let me say what a joy and privilege it is for us to be here with you, and I do bring you greetings from Hobbs, America, as Hobbs, New Mexico is known. Um, I'm not real sure what all goes behind that, but that's what I'm told. Um, uh, And uh, those of you that don't know, I certainly want to let you know that Michael is almost three full years older than I am, (laughs) so uh, I am his younger brother. Uh, but it, it's always a joy uh, to be uh, with, with him and his family, and, and we uh, love every opportunity we get to, to fellowship with them and to be with Dax and Chad as well. Uh, we just thank you so much for the invitation and uh, for allowing us to come and, and be with you and share with you. Uh, today we are going to speak to the issue of evangelizing the lost And we're going to be looking in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 9 to 17. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 17. And so I want to start by reading this passage, and certainly we're going to spend some time focusing on the latter half, verses 14 to 17, but we want to set that up with verses 9 to 13. So beginning with uh, chapter, uh, verse 9 rather of chapter 10 of the book of Romans, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on Him, in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Donald Whitney, in his uh, well-known book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, says that only the sheer rapture of being lost in the worship of God is as exhilarating and intoxicating as telling someone about Jesus Christ. And yet, nothing causes an eye-dropping, foot-shuffling anxiety more quickly among a group of Christians like myself than talking about our responsibility to evangelize. And there's a lot of truth in what he says there. And certainly he speaks about worship, and we heard last night on on, on worship and exalting our Lord and Savior. And and, and the two, obviously, uh, our our evangelism and our, our commitment to that, our willingness to share the message of Jesus Christ is tied directly to our, our understanding of who He is, our, our exalting of Him, when He is our greatest treasure, when we truly embrace the reality that He is worthy of all honor, power, devotion, dominion, uh, then we are uh, willing uh, to share that with others as He is glorified. And certainly one cannot read the Bible and rightly conclude that evangelism is not a necessary activity or purpose of the church. Now, some do, and kind of radical extreme ends of theological views, but if one rightly reads Scripture, I mean, the problem in our churches is not that we don't have never heard of evangelism or know what the Bible says, that we're supposed to tell people about Jesus. Uh, the Bible is clear on that. Uh, Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, to go and make disciples of all nations, And you cannot make a disciple, as we will see today, apart from evangelism, apart from the message of Jesus Christ. 
And we know that His commission was not just for the people who could hear Him that day, else we wouldn't be here. We, we wouldn't have salvation in Christ. Because believers throughout the ages understood this is our mission. They're the ones who, who brought it to where we are. And so this is our mission in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 in Luke's account. Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses all over the world, starting in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. 1 Peter 2 verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And we often Read this passage, and rightly so, in support of the, the priesthood of all believers. But let us note the purpose for all of that. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And Tom Schreiner, commenting on that, says, the declaration of God's praises includes both worship and and evangelism, spreading the good news of God's saving wonders to all peoples. Part of our problem today, you know, there's several reasons we could list as to why we don't evangelize the way that we should. Most Christians know and affirm evangelism is what we're called to, that's our task. Most would also confess, I don't do it as faithfully as I should. And there are a variety of reasons. Fear, fear of failure, fear of rejection. But there is also the doubt that the gospel is in fact the power of God unto salvation. And we know this just by looking at the church culture of today uh, and how that it's clear that many places have moved away either unintentionally or intentionally from the idea that declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ is God's ordained means to save His people. And we know this because it's not the true gospel that's being proclaimed. Things are being left out that are more offensive. It's a more palatable message. It's a more inviting. We don't want to offend anyone. Well, of course, we know the gospel is offensive to us uh, because it, it announces to us, you can do nothing on your own. It is all in Christ. And so we're looking today at Romans 10, 9 to 17 to reinforce what the Bible clearly says concerning the purpose of the church in evangelization and in the evangelization of the lost. Just a few years ago, I was having coffee with a pastor in our association there in the Bay Area of California who also was on the associational staff as a healthy church coordinator. And he kind of in passing made the statement, you know, it's just not about evangelism and discipleship anymore. And uh, this is a good brother. Um, I, I think he, he loves the Lord, but, you know, I immediately began wondering, it's not? It's not about that? Any Has somehow Matthew 28, 19 and 20 been reworded by God? I, I don't, uh, because I do, I, I think it is still about evangelism and discipleship in terms of our mission to the nations. And we see that here. The text before us today is simple in many ways, and I'm thankful for that. I'm, I'm a simple person. Uh, I like to be able to follow and understand what's being said. Uh, Peter has said, and he's right, a lot of what Paul writes is, is hard to understand. Uh, but I think we can follow the logic today. I think we can see what he's saying, and it's my hope that I don't make it more confusing than it is. I mean, I've, I've had the thought, well, we really just need to read it and agree. That's what it says, and, and uh, we have what we need here. But Paul is a master logician. We see it here in the simplistic nature of it, and, and that's part of it as well. Again, it, it is simple. We know evangelism. Let's, we need to be doing that. Uh, but let's just see what the Scripture says here today and, and be reminded uh, of the task that is before us. We'll start with just looking at salvation by faith. And we see this in verses 9 to 13. Of course, one of the major themes and arguments of Paul in the book of Romans is justification by faith. Over and against any idea that one can come into a right relationship with God 
through meritorious good works, through, through performing deeds of the law. Against that notion, Paul uh, teaches and he gets uh, into great depth concerning we are justified by faith. And that is still being presented, presented here in our passage. If you go back up to verse 6, we find Paul speaking of the righteousness that is based on faith in comparison to, in verse 5, the righteousness that is based on the law. In verse 8, Paul speaks of the word that is near, namely the word of faith that he proclaims. And then in verse 9, we kind of get that content. Here here is that word. Here is salvation by faith. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. We see here confession and faith. Verse 9 spells out salvation by faith. This is how righteousness based on faith works. We see the confession here. The confession is that Jesus is Lord. Now let us not just read over that without understanding the significance of this confession. This is not a casual description of who Jesus is. This is the firm belief and understanding that He is the sovereign Lord of all. Again, Schreiner here comments, what must be believed is that Jesus is Lord. This quintessential affirmation is perhaps the earliest Christian confession of faith. It proclaims in the simplest possible words that Jesus of Nazareth is in fact God. The Greek word used throughout the Septuagint for Yahweh over 6,000 times is here applied to Jesus. The implications of this are staggering. Primarily, it means that Jesus' authority is absolute, unlimited, and universal. Those who come to Christ by faith are acknowledging that they have placed themselves entirely and without reserve under His authority to carry out without hesitation whatever He may choose for them to do. There is no such thing as salvation apart from lordship. The confession is Jesus is Lord. And we're told here this confession is made with the mouth. But the faith that leads to this confession is that God has raised Him from the dead. We have to believe in our hearts, truly, that God has raised Him from the dead. This necessarily implies the humanity of Jesus and the reality that He truly died. And of course, we know why He died, as Paul has told us. God put Him forth as a propitiation for our sins in Romans 3. He took upon Himself in death a punishment that we deserve. It was our death that He died. But He rose from the dead because God raised Him from the dead. Death could not hold Him. God raised Him from the dead, and in so doing, death is defeated. Jesus' atoning work on behalf of His people is received and acceptable to God. God has raised Him from the dead. And the heart... Right is where this faith is expressed. Well, why the mouth and the heart? Well, Paul explains here. Again, he's a great logician. And, and he, he follows up this salvation by faith with four, four statements. Four causal statements. Confession is Jesus is Lord. We must confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised Him from the dead. Because it is with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The heart is where true faith is expressed. And in Scripture, the heart is the emotional and spiritual center of who we are. It's not the muscle that pumps the blood. It's it's who we are. It's what we truly are are and think and believe. It's in the heart. That's where this faith has to be expressed. Now given that the heart is naturally deceitful and desperately wicked, 
Our hearts of stone have to be replaced with hearts of flesh. That's exactly what God said He would do in Ezekiel 11 and 36. It's the heart where the faith is expressed. Well, why must the mouth confess Jesus is Lord? Well, this is simple logic. The mouth is the part of the face (laughs) that we confess things with. I heard a comedian say one time, the face of a child says so much, especially the mouth part of the face. (laughs) That's true. that's That's how we confess, right? And so this makes sense. Our heart is who we are. It's it's our very essence, the, the, the center of our spiritual and emotional being. We have to believe that God raised Him from the dead. He is the risen Lord, the risen Christ. And that faith leads to the confession from the mouth that He is in fact Lord. Faith is the key. The confession is the verbal manifestation of that faith. Faith is the key. Why? Well, Paul tells us in verse 11, for because the Scripture says, everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. It is not everyone who does more good than bad. It is not everyone who lives a good life. It is not everyone because God love, God's love ultimately wins. It's everyone who believes. Everyone who believes will not be put to shame at the day of judgment. It is only through faith in Christ that anyone can be saved. Why is this? Well, Paul tells us. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all. When the confession is Jesus is Lord, there is no A. Jesus is not a Lord. He is Lord, period. You may have seen the the, the, the bumper stickers. I use this illustration all the time. You know, Jesus said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, that little part in the middle is irrelevant. Whether I believe it or not has no bearing on whether if Jesus has spoken, it's settled. He's Lord, period. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. He is Lord of all, and He bestows His riches on all who call on Him because of faith. And then verse 13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And again, the Lord who is called upon in verse 13 is not some mysterious, unknown being or a fill-in-the-blank title to put whatever it is you see as Lord there. He is known. He is understood. He is the one who came, who, who lived, who died, and who was raised again. The details about Him are known. How is it? that these who are confessing with their mouth and believing in their hearts know this Jesus? How is it that they know and understand and that their confession and belief is in the Jesus of Scripture and not the Jesus of history that the search and the quests in modern eras have tried to find? Why is it that these people are confessing Jesus is Lord and believing in their heart that God raised Him from the dead and are not thinking of the Jesus of German liberalism, the demythologized Jesus? Why is it that they're not placing their faith in Serenthus' Jesus, who was just a man and the Christ Spirit descended on him and then it departed from him? How is it they're not believing in Arius' Jesus, who was of a similar substance to God, but was not God? How are they confessing rightly that Jesus is Lord and believing rightly that God raised Him from the dead? Well, Paul tells us, and here's the simple answer. Because somebody told them. Somebody proclaimed this Jesus to them. Well, there's the introduction. Now let's get into the evangelism. We see the necessity of evangelism. Paul has stated here very clearly 
It, it, what salvation of faith by faith is. It's confession that Jesus is Lord and it's genuine belief in our hearts that God has raised Him from the dead. Well, how do we get to that point? Well, how do we know how to confess Jesus as Lord and, and believe in that? Well, we have the necessity of evangelism. In verses 14 to 15, Paul advances his argument using four rhetorical questions. Again, simple logic, but profound truth. And the first thing that Paul would, would bring up to our attention here is this. There can be no calling on Jesus without believing in Jesus. In verse 14, how then will they call on Him? Remember verse 13 is all about calling. Jesus is Lord of all and He bestows His riches on all who call on Him. And then verse 13, everyone who calls on Him in this way, in faith, by faith, will be saved. Well, there can be no calling on the one in whom they have not believed. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? Now they here is undefined. And, and getting a firm understanding of who exactly Paul is talking about is not necessarily essential to our understanding of what Paul means. Ultimately, they applies to all people because there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile when it comes to salvation by faith in Christ. No one will call on Him in whom they have not believed. No one will. And so here, believing is given theological, logical, and chronological priority over calling. Again, the calling is, is the manifestation of the belief in our hearts concerning who Jesus is. And the aorist tense of the verb believe, I'm a grammar nerd, would further indicate that. But this is a clear picture in Scripture concerning the notion that what's in the heart is what comes out of the mouth. Right? We find that taught in Scripture. Now, this is why people in Matthew 7 can call out, Lord, Lord, but not enter the kingdom of heaven. Because their calling is not based on their faith in who He truly is. No one can truly call on Him who has not truly believed. And so they can't call on Him if they have not believed in Him. Simple point, but it's sound logic. Makes sense. No one can call on the one in whom they have not believed. But Paul continues here, and, and he keeps getting to the point. There can be no believing in Jesus without hearing about Jesus. And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? Now, I think all of us would affirm, I would hope all of us affirm that God can do and will do anything He desires to do. He's in the heavens. He does as He pleases. But He has revealed to us how He works. He has given us the means by which He accomplishes His purposes. And so on one hand, can God save someone on the other side of the moon? Well, I mean, God has all powerful. But the Scripture says, here's how God saves people. They can't believe in Him if they've never heard of Him. And so this is the means, right? It's, it's the means by which God draws His people and saves His people. They can't believe in Him of whom they've never heard. Believing happens only after hearing. And no one can believe in Jesus apart from hearing about Jesus. And when we talk about the word hearing, this activity, this action, you know, this requires verbal communication. This requires verbal communication. We are emphasizing the need for the church, the purpose of the church in evangelizing the lost. Well, evangelism by definition requires the communication of the gospel. You have heard the phrase talked about, I'm sure, over and over. It's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. We won't get into the arguments of whether he actually said it or not. But the phrase is, preach the gospel when necessary, use words. Well, we understand the, the heart behind that, right? Our, our actions should align with our words. But hearing implies clearly 
communication. There is a verbal communication here that is heard. Mark Galley says, preach the gospel, use words if necessary, goes hand in hand with a postmodern assumption that words are finally empty of meaning. It subtly denigrates the high value that the prophets, Jesus, and Paul put on preaching. Of course, we want our actions to match our words as much as possible, but the gospel is a message. News about an event and a person upon which the history of the planet turns. Other commentator says, More than anything else, this question is the crux of all missiological activity since the first century. God has ordained that people have to hear the Word of God in order to be saved. One who knows the gospel must communicate it to one who does not know it. So the gospel is a message. It contains objective truths. We must communicate those truths. No one believes apart from hearing the gospel about Jesus. I can manifest the power of God's salvation through my actions, a robust commitment of faithful obedience at many levels is observable and gives evidence to the power of the true life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. However, charades, no matter how skillful we are at it, is not the ordained means by which God has chosen to save His people. It's the proclamation of the gospel. Now there is reason in Scripture, and even evangelistic reasons, in a sense, to live out our faith before the unbelieving world. But ultimately, in all those situations, it comes down to a point where when we do this, be ready to give an answer When we live this way, make sure your speech is seasoned with salt so that you know how to answer every man. It leads to opportunities to communicate the gospel. But the means by which God has chosen to save His people is the proclamation of the message of Jesus Christ. Think about Acts chapter 8, when Philip is called by God to go out to the the Ethiopian eunuch. An Ethiopian eunuch is reading from Isaiah. And when we read that story, it's almost like, man, he, that, he got a softball pitch. That's Isaiah 53. Everybody knows this is talking about Jesus. But when Philip asked him, do you know who you're reading about? How can I know? Unless somebody tells me. Well, what did Philip do? He told him. Beginning with that scripture, he preached the good news to him. Because you need to know who this Jesus is. Because this is the only Lord and Savior. And your faith may only be placed in Him if you truly wish to be saved. The Philippian jailer who ran up to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And they gave him the overview of salvation is by faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus. But then what did they do? They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his household. Let me tell you who this Lord Jesus is and why you must believe in him. It is a message that must be proclaimed. And the next part makes this even more clear. So there's going to be no calling on whom they have not believed in. There's not going to be any believing in whom they have not heard. And there can be no hearing about Jesus without someone preaching. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So there can be no hearing that leads to believing apart from the faithful proclamation of the gospel. Now we should not view here someone preaching that should not bring to our mind Sunday morning the pulpit and the pastor. That's part of it. But this is more of a herald. Someone who's been given a message and told, go proclaim this message. Make my message known. And so let us not excuse ourselves because, well, I'm not technically a preacher, so this doesn't apply to me. No, this is, this is God saying, you have a message, proclaim it. Preach it. Speak the gospel to those who are lost. Leon Morris says his verb properly denotes the action, again, of a herald. It is the message of the cross. It is the message of Jesus. The gospel proclaimed that is heard. As God has again chosen this very message 
as the means by which He will save His people. 1 Corinthians 1.21 For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. God is glorified in saving His people through the proclamation of the gospel. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, we've been given this treasure, this treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ in these clay vessels, these jars of clay. Why? So that the power of God may be on display. We have the opportunity every day that God grants us life on this earth to glorify Him by simply proclaiming the gospel message of Jesus Christ. I like how it's said here, unless someone is preaching. We don't have to be the greatest orators. We should strive to speak as clearly as possible. We do not have to be the most advanced theologians. We should study to know as much as we can. But we don't have to be those things. Why? Because the power is in the message and not in the messenger. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel in Romans 1.16 because it is the power of God unto salvation. And we doubt that sometimes. I remember we were on a mission trip to Africa and uh, our youth pastor was with us. We were talking about this thing and how we had been out witnessing and going from house to house and business to business sharing the gospel. He was talking about how you know, at the end of the gospel presentation and inviting people to believe in Jesus and somebody says, I believe that. I want to know Christ as my Lord and Savior. And how his initial thought was, really? You believe that? And in our humanity, I mean, that, wow. (laughs) Because there's a sense in which that's it. That's what, that's what God, that is the power of God. Yes. The gospel rightly proclaimed is the power of God unto salvation. Think about Cornelius when Peter began to preach to them. What happened? As they heard faith, faith began being expressed in their hearts. Peter preached Christ and they believed in the Christ that he preached. This is God's plan. And Paul makes it pretty simple here. They can't hear it if you don't tell them. We must tell them. Then he says his last question, rhetorical question, has the meaning of there can be no one preaching without being sent. And how are they to hear without someone, or how how are uh, they to be preaching, rather, you know, unless they are sent? And while we could read this and deduce from it that we need to be sure we're supporting sending out missionaries, and that is a good and thing that we should be doing. Let us not forget that we all who are in Christ are sent to proclaim this message. People not being sent is not the problem. We're all sent. Go into the world, make disciples. But because it is Christ Himself who has sent us, because it is Christ Himself who has said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth, go. We can have absolute confidence that we will be successful if we go out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we may not see a single person put their faith in Jesus. We may see several. We pray the Lord would bless us with that. But success in evangelism, from our standpoint, is not how many people believe in Jesus. We can't remove the heart of stone and put the heart of flesh. But we can proclaim the gospel, and that's what God uses to do that. And we can be faithful and we can be obedient in that. Evangelism is God's plan. Paul goes on to say, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. See, the beauty of the feet. Why is it that the feet here are beautiful? Well, ultimately the feet are the mode of transportation that gets the mouth part of the face to where it's going. And so if the mouth part of the face comes with the good news of Jesus Christ, that's some beautiful feet that have entered into into your presence. How beautiful. What a glorious thing. There is no greater message. Adrian Rogers famously said, there are many people who may preach the message better than I do. There are none who preach a better message than I do. There is no better message. 
than the good news of Jesus Christ. It is His plan. Verse 16, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what He has heard from us? Earlier He quoted that, that everyone who believes, right? It's always been faith. It's always been faith that brings us into a right relationship with God. Well, guess what? It's always been that not everyone's going to believe. That doesn't mean we abandon course. That doesn't mean we try something else. <laughs> Look, that's true. The Scripture says not everybody's going to believe. But this is our task. This is all we have. <laughs> it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the summary there in verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. And whether we interpret that word about Christ or the, the word from Christ, it's the same. It's the message of the cross. It's the message of the gospel. It's the message that says God is an infinitely holy God and His holiness demands justice against all sin and unrighteousness and He will pour out His wrath against all sin. And every man is a sinner. That's the bad news. But there is good news. Jesus Christ willingly emptied Himself. The One who was with God and was God became flesh and dwelt among us. And He lived a life of absolute perfect righteousness, fulfilling the righteous demands of the law so that our faith in Him, His righteousness gets laid to our account. But there's still that issue of we're lawbreakers and that demands punishment. And so Christ Himself then died an atoning death in our place, taking upon Himself. God pouring out His wrath on Jesus, the punishment that I deserve for my sins. And He took it upon Himself so that God is satisfied. And the resurrection announces from heaven, it is enough, I am satisfied. It is acceptable. So that Christ has both positively fulfilled the righteous requirements demanded of us, and it's ours in Him, and He has negatively, in the sense, fulfilled the, the punishment. He's taken that on Himself. That's the gospel. Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. And He was buried, and on the third day He rose again according to the Scriptures. And that's the gospel. That is the power of God unto salvation. Do we truly desire for people to place their faith in Jesus? And if we do, then we've got to tell Him. Tell Him about Him. Do we love people? more than we love our convenience and our comfort. Is Christ worthy of our full devotion and obedience? Is He so glorious in our lives and in our hearts that there can be nothing else for us to do but tell others about Him? There is no other plan. How can they hear unless someone tells them? We have the task of evangelizing the lost. Let's pray. Father, we thank You and we praise You for the truth of Your Word and the power of it. And Lord, we confess as we read and look and understand this passage today that it is very clear. We are to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ because people need to hear. And they won't hear if we don't tell them. And they won't believe if they don't hear. And they won't call on you if they don't believe. Lord, we affirm that you are in control of all things. We affirm that, that all that you have given to the Son will come to you. But we also affirm what is clearly taught in Scripture. The means by which you do it is the proclamation of the gospel. Help us. Help us to have you as our greatest treasure and our greatest joy such that any other path, any other decision fails in comparison to Your glory, to our desire to bring honor and glory to Your name, so that we will then be faithful in sharing this message with the nations. 
And Lord, I pray for Desert Ridge Baptist Church as they do faithfully proclaim the gospel here in this place where so many are misled and are believing lies. Lord, I pray You would help them to be faithful and that You would bless their efforts. And as they faithfully proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, they would see many come to saving faith in Him and become faithful followers themselves. Wherever we may be, wherever we may go, may we take the message of Jesus with us and proclaim it to those who need to hear. Thank You for being with us and empowering us to do it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.